Uh, thanks so much, for Priscilla, for that, that excellent talk. And it's um, very reminiscent of uh, my early introductions to critical realism, which were thanks to um, your guidance on the critical realism reading group at UCL, which we, you and I are now running, running together, um, which has been, again, a great learning experience for me as well. Um, but something that's, that we, you touched on in the talk, and I think it would be worth um, elaborating, is on the epistemic fallacy. So could you tell us a little back? It's such a fundamental concept to critical realism, if we just revisit that, and if you could expand on that. It is fundamental. And uh, critical realism is known for being dense and hard, so we aim to make it as clear as we possibly can. On the other hand, like any, any experts, from plumbers to doctors, we have to use uh, some... Uh, technical words. And at the heart of social research theory are the two Greek words, epistemology and ontology, which are very off-putting. I was put off them for years. And then I realized how important it is to come to terms with them and use them in our analysis. And basically I use epistemology to mean thinking about things and ontology to mean more the reality of what we're studying um, and very often the two get confused. So, for example, in childhood studies, people often refer to children and childhood interchangeably as if they're the same thing. But of course, childhood is the abstract ideas of how we think about them. And children are the real, actual living people, entirely different. And so the epistemology, the idea, childhood, <clears throat> sort of absorbs and collapses the ontology of real actual children mm. and that's and i suppose that's similar similar to we've talked about similarities with that with my some of my work which has been critiquing counter extremism policy in the uk as a branch of counter terrorism where by labeling extremists we collapse all of the complexity all of the causes of political violence gets collapsed into this one buzzword almost and and all meaning gets lost in, in a sim similar way um uh, and i suppose and, and the, by revealing those the real by by making the distinction between um uh the real and our and our labeling of it i suppose um uh that helps us un uncover and you mentioned this as well uncover real causal mechanisms and that's such a fundamental thing i'll, I'll repeat it again so real causal me mechanisms um, and something that that we can neg easily neglect if we don't don't have an awareness of them. Um, so, what for your research? What unseen real causal mechanisms have entered into your work since engaging with critical realism? Because I know that you came to critical yeah. realism later in your research career. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I researched childhood for about thirty years, getting more and more worried about contradictions and gaps in um, the main traditions. And so to come across critical realism in 2009 was a, a great revelation to me. And since then, by the way, I've written two books. I was commissioned to write in the critical realism applied sociology series in Routledge on the politics of childhoods, real and imagined, and childhoods, real and imagined, on causal mechanisms. And that's another clunky phrase. Why don't we say causes? The reason we don't <laughs> is that there are never in social research, single obvious causes, but there are many, many powerful influences that do have effects. Sometimes they're counter effects and unwanted effects. But when we think about childhood and think about, say, um, families, schools, those words, you know, massively complex, contradictory, changing, varied ideas, they're not at all simple. So, um, causal mechanisms is thinking about the deep, often unseen underlying reality, a bit like the, in the pandemic, there's the virus. Um, and we've been looking at children's consent to surgery. So um, the critical realism looked at three levels of reality. First of all, the sort of epistemic thinking and talking about it, which is informed consent, uh, doctors and patients exchange ideas. Um, then the next level is the actual problem to be treated, the actual surgical technique and processes of surgery, the signing of the form. Now in consent, the actual is whether the person cooperates willingly or resists and protests and refuses. And children are very good at doing this. Um, 
Now the third level, which is so much neglected in the literature, but which is the real level of consent to anything, to surgery, to marriage, to anything, is the willing commitment, the wanting to go through with it, the taking on of the risks because um, the benefits are so much hoped for. Um, mm -hmm. And this uh, voluntary, unseen emotions of trust and hope and confidence, they are the sort of real causal mechanisms that drive people's consent and agreement. Mm. And I, I suppose, I mean, I, and I, immediately as you're talking, I, I can see how in a kind of clinical setting, how important that is where, as you said, that a child might be actually resisting um, and having to separate that out from, from, from the real need and the, perhaps the real consent, which is not totally aligned with the surface emotion that we're, we're witnessing in that moment. Yes, um, and in the past, um, adults haven't, first of all, haven't bothered much to tell children or, or thinking it's too complex, it's above them. Mm. Uh, there's been a lot of force going on, but we were amazed when we started researching in two London hospitals about heart surgery. I said to one surgeon, uh, what if a four-year-old actively protested against the surgery um, and the anaesthetic mask being placed on? Mm. And what would you do? And he would said, cancel it. He respected the views of the four year old. And, and then what they would do is um, have um, plays, therapists, um, psychologists, nurses, parents, everyone helping children to understand that um, their want for the benefits of the surgery to help their health and well being and their activities. Um, and to accept and understand the processes were not meant to harm and hurt them. Um, and to accept that and increase their confidence, which is what now happens. So um, this is really respectful of a young children in a way we didn't expect. And um, it contradicts most of the law and ethics literature still mm, on mm. Uh, children's consent. And, so, and so, 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 so important for the for the individual child, if you think of the, the traumatic repercussions in the future of not, not, not taking care to gain that consent. Yeah, um, what they need to understand isn't necessarily the technologies of surgery and the problem of a heart defect, but the adult's intention to help them, not harm them, and the hope for better health. Mm, mm. And I, th I think, and, and that, um, that really neatly encapsulates the idea that, that, that that the surgeon is being more concerned with by consent encapsulates a, a, a change in social structures over time because presumably that wouldn't have been the case 30 or 40 years ago. Oh um, no, I did, I did my PhD on parents' consent to children's heart surgery in the 1980s and uh, then the question was is it worth asking parents because they're so upset they probably won't understand and anyway the mm. child needs the heart surgery and so on and I looked at this emotional journey that parents need to go through from fear and horror at the idea of their child mm. being sliced open to um, confidence, hope and commitment, these underlying causal mm. mechanisms. I wish I'd known critical realism then because it would have yeah. increased my the clarity of my analysis, I'm sure, and it helped me. And, and one, one of the, the, the main ways in which critical realism, I think, helps in any form of analysis is in, in, a, in a, an appreciation of both structure and agency and the way that structure and agency interact Very across, much, across yeah. time. Um, so, so presumably that's been something that's contributed that, to that shift in understanding. Yes, so much, because um, again, I said that over 30 years I got more and more puzzled and a lot of research like the big cohort surveys, randomised trials and so on, um, put great emphasis on the structures, the variables around people, the anonymous agents who were sort of pushed around by them. In contrast, um, interpretive studies tend to look at how agents draw on surrounding structures, stronger agents, weaker structures. Critical realism so, says that um, sees um, structures as immensely strong, lasting, enduring, preceding and outlasting us, but completely depending on our agency. A school, for instance, is an empty building until the children and teachers come in and turn it into a place of learning. And they are constantly changing, um, knocking against the structures, reinforcing and building them, changing them, a bit like um, a river and a landscape. So critical realism recognises the difference between human conscious agents 
and the structures around them, but also looks at the, the dialectic, the interaction, the constant changing between the two. And yeah. Margaret Archer's work is very important here. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I find this is a sort of a, a bit of a, um, a tangent, but I, I certainly find, I'm sure, and we've talked about this before, that this understanding of structure and agency does help one to appreciate the world as we move through it ourselves, not just in our own research. And, and I was given off a great hope yesterday. I found myself yesterday afternoon for, thankfully not for me, but for someone else, spent quite a significant amount of time in an accident, an emergency department in our local hospital. And I was blown away by the, although the, there were social structures that were making this a very difficult place for all of the people working there, all of the NHS workers working there. Um, but the, 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 the kindness that, the, that they were expressing was, so they still, their agency was still enabling them to, to be, and it just gave me great hope, hope in humanity that they were able to still be kind, even because, but, but in, in the face of very oppressive structures that they were working within. Yes, and sometimes the more oppressive and harsh the structures, the more um, people rise to the occasion. And, mm. and, 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 I, and I suppose that, and that's actually a, a way that, that yes, that, that sort of what might be seen as quite a sort of academic theory actually can 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 have can have a, a very sort of humane outcome and, and offer a very humane understanding of the world. Um, oh yes. Critical realism is so practical, I think. Mm. And also I think it gives, um, well, critical means that it's in the Marxist tradition of criticizing, um, but also um, the realism is about accepting that there are deep realities and surface realities. And that I think makes our work so much more um, available and useful to the public, to professionals, to politicians, mm -hmm. Policy and so on, and yeah. links it in much more clearly. I think absolutely, and, and I've I've done quite a lot on various projects that I've worked on have have had quite a lot of dealings with politicians in in Westminster, and and I I find even in in conversations that I'm having with them, I'm constantly drawing on critical realism, even even if I'm not mentioning or or using any of the sort of ter terminology, it constantly informs those those discussions. So it's a it's huge, you know. I think it's just not for not just for research, as you say, it's incredibly useful just for being in the world, um, and that that bringing in being in the world. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned this in your talk or not, but the, another very important concept, particularly in the context of structure and agency, are the um, uh, four planes of social being. Um, and that offers a, as, a, as a way of categorizing some of the changes in structure and agency over time. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, beside uh, many concepts, and by the way, there's a 500 page dictionary free online. Um, redefining, enlarging on, deepening our understanding of all kinds of um, terms relating to social research um, and life. Um, now, the four planes of social being is more a method of analysis. And a, a lot of um, students on our doctoral reading group um, didn't come across critical realism until the third year of their PhD when they were beginning to write up. But that was fine because Critical realism is a philosophy, it's not a research method. And so when it, it comes in, in the data analysis stage, it's really. And the, um, the four planes of social being um, are a way of analyzing and managing huge data sets. So if you've done a very small study, for example, you could still do a large literature review that can take on bigger ideas to nest your own research into and increase your analysis. And the four planes are, first of all, um, bodies in relation to nature. Now, um, I'll give the example of my um, student, Kate Martin's PhD, uh, with young people in psychiatric wards. And what do bodies and nature have to do with psychiatry? <laughs> Isn't it all in the mind? And because she began with bodies, she realized so dramatically how badly treated the bodies were and how the staff ignored the um, young people's bodies and bodily presence. A, a ward round, for example, took place in the staff room without the young people there at all. <laughs> um, so uh, this alerted Kate to so many ideas that would have been invisible and absent, another um, very important concept in critical realism, absence. The next is um, interpersonal relationships, very obvious in that research. 
that this is agency really. The third is larger social structures and concerns, politics, economics, structure of the health service, and also, of course, why young people's um, mental health is um, deteriorating. And um, the fourth stage is inner being and uh, real attention to people's um, deeper thoughts, feelings, um, and very, very important when interviewing young people in these hospitals. Yeah, yeah. And something that we're not gonna gonna go into right now, but is the 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 Roy Bascar, the sort of father of critical realism, and his later work on meta-reality. And when we start talking about about being and inner beings, that's that's hugely important. But I know we're, we're not going to go into that, but certainly that's something that's helped helped me a huge amount in some of my work. Um, and I just just this is um I suppose talking about um Kate's work and the the reality of of people's lived experience. Um, we've talked about um, how critical realism can help our understanding of refugees in boats. What's presented as a refugee crisis at the moment. Um, I certainly see it as a as a crisis for the refugees, but perhaps it's that crisis is, has a little slightly slanted in a slightly different way by the by the press. Um, could you say a little about that? Because I think you saw, you had a. a you, you you use that as quite a useful example for how critical realism can help in our understanding of these situations. Yes, um, many people use the four planes um, to structure their PhD, the four main chapters on one of each of the planes. And I've used that as chapters in my books. But um, another great um, theoretical framework analysis is the four stages of transformative change. Um, and uh, you can see the need for it when you see how most people get stuck on stage two. For example, the government claims that it needs to stop um, the smugglers um, um, causing the problem. And they're going to stop it by turning back the boats, uh, frightening the refugees into not using the system and so on. This is stage two, intervene. Now in the four stages, stage one is investigate the problem and I'll analyze it, look at the hidden depths of it. Why are people seeking refuge in the UK? And that goes back to all sorts of reasons like um, warfare, uh, political violence, um, economic destitution, uh, climate effects of climate change, all sorts of deep, huge problems that we desperately need to address if we're really going to um, look at the refugee problem and think about the future when there'll be more and more refugees, partly because of climate change. What, what is um, a practical, reasonable, humane policy? That's stage one, investigate. Stage two is then intervene based on the investigations so that the policy will be entirely different. For example, the refugees at the present seek illegal routes into the UK because there aren't any legal ones. It was far cheaper for them to get on a plane and be quickly processed either at home or here. Um, but we're cutting the civil service and all these sorts of things are going on. So again, the interventions um, need to take account of the political economies, um, international relations and all sorts of things that will be investigated at stage one. Stage three, having uh, decided a policy and intervened and introduced your policy is then to step back and look. How is it working? What are the problems? Um, do we need different interventions? And what are the larger effects? And in this case, it will be the larger effects back in the home countries of the refugees and what happens to them in this country when um, they've arrived. Um, the whole bigger picture, that's stage three. This is another kind of like stage one, a kind of investigation stage. Stage four, again, is um, a practical stage of reflecting on the personal and political changes that have been wrought and how we have change only happens deeply when it occurs on many, many levels, including our inner being. Um, and how have we changed personally and politically? How have the um, British public changed in their attitudes led by the government to support um, a practical, workable, humane policy? And then um, the, uh, the four planes are cyclical. So there's at stage four, you also think about how you can apply your knowledge when you return to stage one and work through the next cycle, because 
you'll change the new interventions, we'll have set up new structures and systems that will need to be um, worked on mm. because everything constantly changes. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's really useful. And and I'll, I'm just going to mention again as well that the the that that um, schema or methodology was further elaborated with the with this later work on meta reality, uh, where where you you and if you if people get interested in that, where it then you start questioning how you need to change yourself to to address those problems as well. Um, so there are there are ways that this this continue you can continue that process of of um, of elaborating your research. Um, I'm going to bring it back to because we're talking about childhood here. So I want to bring it back to, to childhood um, and care. Um, and so and it relates it to something I was recently reading, which was an analysis of Freud's correspondence. Um, Sig Sigmund Freud, father of psychoanalysis, his, his correspondence. And the author of this analysis suggested that the development of psychoanalysis had been severely hindered by Freud having limited contact with his own children and also his recruiting women into the field who became wedded to the profession and therefore didn't have or didn't spend time with their own children. Um, and now we've talked, you and I Priscilla have talked about the importance of learning from our own children and babies and not just our own biological children but we've both had the immense privilege of being parents but also teachers um, and something I think has informed both of our work, all those children that we've had the privilege of learning from. Um, However, there's a tendency within the academy, within academic research, to, to keep our own caring relationships separate from our research. Um, always keep those things separate, keep them at arm's length. Um, but there's clearly a balance to be struck. And for both of us, we've been informed by those relationships, um, and particularly in the study of childhood, where I think this is a particularly important thing to, thing to, to address. Um, so could you offer any advice for how other researchers can work with this balance? Yes, um, another um, great critical realist um, is Andrew Sayer, who has written his book on how uh, values pervade all social research. It's impossible to be objective and value free. Um, if you do that, you're siding with the powerful on the whole. So um, another thing is um, he questions the, the idea of objectivity as being not subjective, um, detached, remote and apolitical, saying, of course, you must be objective in terms of being rigorous, initially impartial, listening carefully to everything. But you also cannot avoid then drawing conclusions where there are, say, inequalities of power. And this pervades childhood studies, obviously, doesn't it? During my PhD in the 1980s, I noticed um, a great change beginning to happen because um, the, the conditions were pretty harsh um, and there was a ward sister and um, a play worker who were particularly hostile to parents and tried to get them out all the time. Um, but then they went away and had their babies and um, for the first time, uh, they were the first to return to their profession after a few months rather than being excluded. Um, and um, they were so much more kind and supportive to the parents. They'd learned so much from their babies. Um, and again, uh, Judy Dunn, the great child psychologist has pointed out that um, it was women returning from looking after their young children who changed the, the approaches in child psychology away from men conducting arcane experiments in labs on children and measuring them to observing their daily lives and their interactions. Um, and um, I expect some people have read the wonderful work of um, Alison Gopnik on, and Paul Bloom on, on how amazing pre-verbal babies are, which transforms ideas that um, only thinking and uh, communication can happen with words. Again, Margaret Archer is good on this. So um, I, again, this idea that babies, um, understand about morality it seems innately at um in their very early months before anyone can explain it to them in words um so that relates to my work on children's rights um, and how rights are on the whole embodied and expressed and experienced honored or violated through our bodies um often without words so that they are um they are all age things you don't have to be a sort of literate thinking, talking person, you can be a thinking baby to have rights. Mm -hmm. 
and I think and I think that's that's probably a, probably quite a um, person to end on because I think we do we're living through quite a quite a worrying time in terms of rights that that certainly in the UK that um, human rights legislation is being severely winnowed away or threatened at the moment um, and 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 I think and we, possibly we can use that as an example of emergence which is a very important aspect of critical realism because a few years ago when right-wing politicians in the UK started talking about doing away with human rights it it wasn't a possibility it didn't it didn't seem that it was they were they were a few kind of niche publications by right-wing think tanks um, and there was sort of there was a concern, but it wasn't it wasn't really going to happen. And now we're at a point where we're about to have debates in Parliament where we're probably going to lose some very fundamental rights. Um, and so that's for me, critical realism helps to understand how that possibility didn't exist, and then the possibility of the possibility emerged, a new reality has has emerged, which is very 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 important as well. Um, so thank you uh, thank you very much Priscilla I think that's really useful and also but just to bring it back to to these ideas around care and I think there's a there's also a great hope there from what you just said about the shift in the 1980s with um you know the, the shift in 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 you know parents being involved and appreciation of the need for parents being involved and also that recent shift as well that we talked about at the start of um of children's consent being appreciated as well so hopefully that that offers sort of positive hope although there are scary things on the horizon there is there are positives in there as well and also um, if people want to find out more about critical realism um, they can look up my youtube channel so rob for walker um, my, just search me on google on my youtube channel and all of last term's critical realism uh, reading group lectures are up there so people who want to have take a bit more interest can look at them or keep an eye out because we'll be running that reading group next year and it's open to anyone who wants to come, come along and join us